Hi, I'm Richard Sedlock. Welcome to the Green Ninja course on climate science. This is episode 22, in which we investigate social scenarios of the future and future projections of climate that are based on these scenarios and on the climate change models that we talked about in episode 21. Episode 22 starts off slowly with some word slides, but before long it heats up considerably. How is climate science, or any kind of science for that matter, conducted and made public? Before climate research is published in professional journals, it undergoes peer review, a kind of vetting process to make sure that errors, bias, or outright idiocy don't clutter the pages of journals. Scientists usually collaborate, often internationally. It's common for a climate paper to have a dozen authors representing several countries. Every year, hundreds, probably thousands, of research papers are published about climate or climate change, and no single person could possibly keep track of all of them. Fortunately, climate research is periodically reviewed and published in an up-to-date assessment of, of the, the state of climate science by the IPCC, or Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC consists of 10 full-time staff in Geneva, Switzerland, plus a few staffers elsewhere in the world. But the IPCC's actual work is done by thousands of scientists and research institutes worldwide who volunteer cumulatively tens of thousands of hours of their time to read, critique, and synthesize the voluminous scientific studies of climate and climate change that constantly are published. The IPCC publishes an assessment report every six years or so. Each of these is written by over 450 lead authors and 800 contributing authors. Three stages of peer review involve over 2,500 other scientists. So it's no surprise that it takes over three years to complete one of these assessment reports. Projecting or predicting future climate faces many uncertainties, and not just those inherent in the stunningly complex climate system itself. A similarly dawning set of uncertainties arises because of humans. Our species has become such an overwhelming agent of massive change that many scientists support the assignment of a separate geologic time period to the last few hundred years. They would call it the Anthropocene in recognition of we hope not in memory of, Homo sapiens. As the 21st century proceeds, what, what choices will humans make about land use or resource, resource exploitation and consumption or economic activity, or population growth, ecologic sustainability? Will we pursue a, a business as usual, that's B-A-U, path, consuming resources and letting population continue to grow? Will the globalization of the economy persist or expand or shrink? Will environmental concerns become more important to people? How would this affect their willingness to accept what appear to be expensive climate modification measures? Obviously, no one knows what humans will do, but we can outline a range of possible scenarios called storylines that adopt different responses to these questions and then apply the global climate models to the different storylines. The IPCC has developed 40 such scenarios and used them throughout its last two reports. The reports, by the way, were issued in 1990, 1995, 2001, and 2007. The 40 scenarios are organized into four families, A1, A2, B1, and B2. Each of them contains internally similar scenarios. And this schematic cartoon shows a simplified way to illustrate the main features of each of the four families. We have global scale families on the left, A1 and B1, and regional scale on the right, it's A2 and B2. And then we have scenarios that have an economic, or futures that have an economic focus on the top, so that would be A1 and A2, and futures that have an environmental focus on the bottom for B1 and B2. So A1. Scenarios in A1 envision globalization, rapid economic growth, and cultural homogenization. Basically, business as usual. <laughs> At least what usual was until 2008. In A2, the scenarios still focus on economic growth, 
but with less global connection among countries. B1 scenarios envision an integrated, environmentally friendly world. B2 scenarios envision a world that's smaller and more divided than in B1, but still environmentally friendly. Now, whether these scenarios are particularly relevant in a crippled global economy is debatable. But even more problematic is that the IPCC scenarios ignore the uncomfortable fact that natural resources aren't infinite and that this will cause, heck, already is causing critical bottlenecks for exponentially growing populations with exponentially growing consumption habits. Perhaps the next IPCC scenario being worked on currently and due in 2013 will take a more realistic approach to these issues. Anyway, the scenarios are what we have at the moment, so take them with a grain or lump of salt. In the next several slides, we'll see how the scenarios are used in projections of our climate future. And this graph shows the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere with historical data from the year 1000 to the year 2000 and projections through the year 2100. The hockey stick, hockey stick shape is obvious. Curves of different colors represent different IPCC scenarios. Now because the 21st century is so cramped and a little hard to see, I've stretched the time axis so that it fills this entire second graph. The curves again represent different IPCC scenarios, but the different uh, specific colors are different than in the first graph because these two came from different sources. Anyway, recall that the A1 and A2 scenarios emphasized economic growth and that B1 and B2 emphasized environmental health. Well, the scenario that produces the highest CO2 concentration, A1FI, shown here in red, assumes maximum use of fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, and coal. Fortunately, it's also unrealistic because, as we'll see later in this series, we probably don't have enough fossil fuels to get to 900 or 1,000 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. Of course, that's kind of bad news, too, as we'll see later. A2 and A1b, shown in blue and yellow, also come in very high in the 700 to 800 part per million range. Even the environmentally friendly type B scenarios come in with values over 500 parts per million, values that are still likely to trigger major climate changes. The IPCC developed the scenario types in 2000 and used that as the baseline year from which we would track our progress. Since then, CO2 emissions have followed the type A growth scenarios. This isn't a surprise because humans have taken no substantive steps to reduce emissions in the last decade. At least they took no intentional ones. See that how that black curve dips in 2008 and 2009? The black curve is actual observed CO2, what actually happened. That was an unintentional decline caused by the near collapse of the global economic system. Less commerce, less trade, less travel, less fossil fuel consumption. Well, even though the global economic system is still very, very troubled, it managed to recover enough for humans to regain their type A emissions rate by 2010. Here are global warming projections for the next century. We again see that the type A scenarios are leading the pack with increases of at least two and up to five or six degrees C. That's four to 11 degrees Fahrenheit. Even the type B scenario is called a 1 to 4 degrees C of warming. That's 2 to 7 degrees Fahrenheit. That orange curve is the warming we'd see if atmospheric CO2 was held at its 2,000 level. Well, we're already well beyond that, from, from 370 parts per million to 394 in 12 years, with no sign of slowing down. So that orange curve's, curve seems sadly irrelevant now. Well, this increased warming won't be evenly distributed around the globe. This projection for scenario A2 shows that warming will particularly affect the high latitudes of the northern hemisphere, the Arctic, Canada, and Russia. Significant warming will also affect most of North America and, and Europe and much of Asia. Continents will heat more than oceans for reasons that were discussed in episode 13 of this series. 
Remember that climate includes more than just temperature. Precipitation patterns will also be greatly changed. This kind of busy map shows the percentage change in precipitation around the world at the end of this century for one of the A1 scenarios. The scale at the left shows that blues indicate areas that will be wetter, pinks and browns indicate areas that will be drier. The black dots show areas where almost all of the models are in agreement. Areas in white indicate areas where the models don't agree well, so perhaps little change will happen there. Sea level change is probably the least understood of all the changes I'm showing in this episode. The possible range assigned to each scenario is very wide, reflecting our imperfect understanding. Even more uncertainty would arise if the IPCC scientists included the effects of possible tipping points in the climate system. In fact, several recent studies of sea ice and ice sheets and other variables have come to the alarmed and alarming conclusion that sea level rise will be on the high side of the ranges that are shown here and could exceed one meter by the end of the century. That's very bad news for hundreds of millions of people who live in coastal areas. Here's a variable we haven't yet talked about, soil moisture. If soil dries out, agriculture there becomes more problematic and expensive. This type A scenario projects that many parts of the world will face this issue by the end of the century. Again, the black dots indicate areas where the models are in strong agreement. Much drier soils are very likely in the southern U.S. and throughout Mexico and Central America, all around the Mediterranean, in South Africa, and in what are currently the richest agricultural areas of the Middle East and Australia. Such changes will challenge humanity's ability to feed itself, especially if its population continues its relentless growth. That's the end of episode 22.